Philemon, we continue our prison epistles, and now we're back to Philemon. We're going to look at what we can learn from the book of Philemon. It's only 25 verses, so real short, and it's really central in a topic. It's a personal letter from Paul to Philemon, all about Onesimus, a man named Onesimus, written around, who knows, but around AD 64, be a guess, during his, if you believe in two imprisonments, which I lean toward, his first imprisonment, Paul's first imprisonment. Onesimus is a slave. We'll, we'll, we'll read it. I won't just talk. But Onesimus is a slave who ran away from his master Philemon. Um, it's thought that he probably even stole something during the process. So he, he's indebted to Philemon in more ways than one. But now Onesimus is saved under Paul's ministry. Is this making sense so far? Onesimus is saved during Paul's ministry as he's imprisoned, I guess, over there in Rome. Let's read verse 1. Paul, a prisoner of Jesus Christ, and Timothy, our brother, and to Philemon, our dearly beloved and fellow laborer. Philemon, he's called dearly beloved, a fellow laborer. He's a Christian, Philemon. He also owns this slave named Onesimus. Slavery and believers. I'm not going to talk long on this, but slavery has been around for a long time. You know that? It has. And it's been different throughout time periods. When you have peoples conquering other peoples, um, what do you do with those peoples who are conquered? Right? You have nations that fought against you forever, and then you take them over. What do you do with those peoples? So back in these times, there's all kinds of different slaves, slave owners, it's not as cut and dry. I firmly stand against the idea that you should go to Africa and pick up a slave and come back. That is immoral, and I think our nation is still bearing the fruits from those immoral decisions, right? Doesn't make any sense. But I'm just saying here that slavery has been throughout history. So when you see it in the Bible that a slave should um, be faithful to where his calling is and a master should be faithful to his calling, just understand that there's a lot of history behind this, and it's not as cut and dry as sometimes we might think. Okay. I'm not going to talk about that long at all. But slavery has existed not just for one people. Jews have been slaved throughout history. Irish people. And I'm 97% I'm Irish. No, I'm not. My wife's pretty Irish. But Irish have gone through hard things as well. Let's look at verse 2. And to our beloved Aphia and Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church in thy house. I believe Aphia is Philemon's wife. Archippus, I believe, is Philemon's son. And to the church in thy house. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God, make mention of thee always in my prayers, hearing of thy love and faith which thou hast toward the Lord Jesus and toward all saints, that the communication of thy faith may become effectual by the acknowledging of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. I like how he says that the communication of thy faith may become effectual, kind of like the word effective, by the acknowledging of every good thing which is in Christ Jesus. Our testimonies of faith are improved as we learn and we grow in the scriptures. We learn and grow more in the word of God. And we um, find doctrine that's more sound, doctrine that's more perfect, better words to speak. He says in verse 7, For we have great joy and consolation in thy love, because the bowels of the saints are refreshed by thee, brother. If it sounds like Paul is buttering up Philemon a little bit, I think he is. He's warming him up, because he's got a request to ask here, something he's going to ask, and he's going to try to ask Philemon to change. And I learned one thing from Paul here that I don't think, while well, you shouldn't lie to people and flatter people, it's okay to be nice to people. Especially if you're about to ask them that, to change something, you know. It's okay. So here he, he warms them up. He talks about how great joy and how great, you know, love he has for him. And now he's going to ask Philemon to do something that he might not have considered doing. Eight. Wherefore, though I might be much bold in Christ to enjoin thee that which is convenient. Verse eight to me means he's saying... It'd be easier if I just told you the easy things. It'd be a lot more convenient if I just didn't challenge you on anything. And truly, isn't that the case? 
it'd be my and your relationships and your relationship brothers and sisters it'd be much easier if we never challenged anything but then also nothing's ever sharpened that way right that little bit of iron and sharpening iron where there is some ouch and there's some cuts sometimes we've got to remember that's valuable especially in christian ministry that's how we get sharper right there's a conflict minor or large we come together in that moment one of us will get sharper or maybe both of us will maybe we're both wrong in some way it's too bad that in christianity today in christian circles we say it's better to just agree to disagree you know i've preached against that saying i don't like it because that means you're agreeing for someone to just be wrong why don't you in love try to work out a path together a common road to walk upon be better I'm not saying everything. There's small things that let's not even waste our time about. But larger things for sure. He says here in verse 9, he makes his request. Yet for love's sake, well, he's still building up to it. Excuse me, 9. Yet for love's sake, I rather beseech thee, being such an one as Paul the aged, and now also a prisoner of Christ, to say, I'm going to ask you these things, and would you respect my position? Because one, I'm old, and two, I'm being persecuted by the world. So would you hear me out, hear me out? I like his tactics, don't you? I think we should hear people out who we know are being attacked by the world. Hear somebody out who you know is giving their heart to the ministry. You know that? You just hear somebody out. I think, I think we should give that kind of respect and love. If we can see that, well, the world has rejected this person, so I'm at least going to give them 10 minutes of my time, because I can see that. Other people who have found a home in the world, I don't hold as much respect for, because they found what they were looking for. But Paul is an outcast. He's in prison. People did not like him. So he says, listen to me, please. Look at verse 10. I beseech thee for my son Onesimus, whom I have begotten in my bonds. And he led him to the Lord while a prisoner. 11. Which in time past was to thee unprofitable, but now profitable to thee and me. They say that Onesimus' name actually means profitable. But here he was for Philemon. He was a slave who ran away and probably stole stuff in the process. So Paul says he wasn't profitable for you. But now he's profitable for me because he's born again. Look at 12. Whom I have sent again, thou therefore receive him, that is, mine own bows. The request that Paul is making, more or less, he's asking Philemon to receive Onesimus to forgive Onesimus, and to accept him as a saved man. Paul's testifying of who this man is. It says in verse 13, Whom I have retained with me, that in my stead he might have ministered unto me in the bonds of the gospel. But without thy mind would I do nothing, that thy benefit should not be as it were of necessity, but willingly. He says, I want Onesimus, I'd like him to stay here and minister with me, but I understand he's got an obligation to you. I understand that. So he says, I'm not going to do anything without asking you about it. Very courteous man, isn't he? Paul is wise, and I'm sure he got this wisdom from God Almighty. I'm sure he wasn't born with it. 15, none of us are born with it. 15, for perhaps he therefore departed for a season, that thou shouldest receive him forever. Paul speaks here, he says, he's asking Philemon to think big picture. Let's not be mad at this guy because God worked a miracle as he ran away and as he was, uh, you know, evil, unsaved, he got saved. And now look big picture. It might be that now he can be used forever in a more profound way. 16, not now as a servant, but above a servant, a brother beloved, especially to me, but how much more unto thee, both in the flesh and in the Lord. Paul's pleading that this man, he's saved and he can be used. God, and he wants Philemon to view him that way. If thou count me therefore a, par a partner, receive him as myself. If he hath wronged thee or oweth thee aught, put that on mine account. I, Paul, have written it with mine own hand, I will repay it. He's ready to repay. Watch what he says, though. Paul says, Albeit I do not say to thee how thou owest unto me, even thine own self besides. <laughs> Paul says, There is this thing about I led you to the Lord, Philemon. Right? Doesn't that count for some kind of value? So he says, Receive this other man I've led to the Lord. 20, Yea, brother, let me have joy of thee in the Lord. Refresh my bowels in the Lord. Having confidence in thy obedience, I wrote unto thee, knowing that thou wilt also do more than I say. 
Yeah. Yeah, I guess it's good. It's good to give people the benefit of the doubt. Pray for me. Sometimes, sometimes I, I pray and I, I do talk to people when God tells me to say hard things. I try to do my best. But then pray for me that I ha have more optimism. Sometimes I'm just used to people walking away from the truth that I'm starting to get in the habit now. We're like, oh, they're not going to listen. I'm not going to see them again. There it goes. <laughs> and I shouldn't be that way. Paul wasn't that way. But it is hard. Sometimes a lot of people do walk away when they're, when they're hit with something that they just don't agree with or that uh, rubs them the wrong way. 22, but with all, prepare me also a lodging, for I trust that through your prayers I shall be given unto you. Paul still thinks he might get out of uh, prison here and have some freedom. It doesn't happen uh, to that extent. 23, there salute the Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, Marcus, Aristarchus, Demas, Lucas, my fellow laborers. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. So, I know people can study it a lot more in depth, but as far as a basic overview of the book, do we understand a little bit what's going on here? Does it make sense, Emma? It does? What are some things we can learn from this short letter? Short personal letter. This isn't written to a bunch of churches. This is written to a man. And so I like seeing kind of the, if you can say the humanity of Christianity, it's kind of the day-to-day the -day living of a Christian's life in this book. What do we see? We see one thing, don't we? We see the concept of forgiveness, do we not, throughout the chapter, throughout the book? We should forgive others. He's pleading that that would happen. I even see here that, um, well, we should forgive others. We should seek the forgiveness of others. And then I also see here a principle that we should seek forgiveness and reconciliation for other parties. Right? Paul's not involved in this quarrel between these two, but he thinks Philemon's saved, and he thinks that Onesimus is saved, and he thinks, hey, you guys should be able to join together here and see each other as saved people, um, despite all the history here. To be involved, though, in the ministry of reconciliation between parties in this earth, I think one thing is required. We should have a sense of who wronged who, shouldn't we? Because you see Paul saying, I understand. Yep, Onesimus did this and it wasn't right. And he did this and it wasn't right. I understand. But can we work it out? I think that would be a requirement if you're going to try to bring parties to reconciliation. If you feel God calling you to do something like that. Other times it's better to not put your hands on an angry dog sometimes, right? <laughs> Keep your hands off. <laughs> Don't meddle in other men's affairs is another side of that coin. So prayerfully. But here Paul is obviously prayed up and he's busy about forgiveness. What else do we learn from this book? I, I think we learn that salvation changes things. It should. Salvation changes things. It changes dynamics of how we should view people, right? If someone comes forward today, and I don't care if they've been a drug addict for 20 years and we see they come forward and make a true profession of faith and by every account they're professing the right thing it seems that they got saved then let's give them the benefit of the doubt and they're saved let's give them the benefit of the doubt should change how we view people when they profess Christ of course we'll watch fruits of course but Paul believes that Onesimus is saved but I have a question here, and now we're getting down to another topic, and here's where I'm sure we'll get to all the confusing stuff. But I only preach it because I believe God has me come back to this. I have a question. Did salvation make Onesimus no longer a slave? No, still a slave. Did salvation pay the debt the manly debt that he owed to Philemon. Did it pay the debt? No, it didn't, did it? Didn't, did it? Paul's asking for those things. Like, hey, can you work out this slave thing? Can you work out this debt thing? Paul, so it didn't, salvation didn't automatically change any of these things. There's a key concept that I believe our world is missing and liberal churches are missing that you can see in this book of Philemon. The key concept, I believe, is that salvation saves your soul. It does. But it doesn't magically undo all the worldly consequences of sin, does it? Does it? This concept, if you look over in Galatians, look back in Galatians. I think this concept is an important one for the Christians still to grasp. Galatians 6, verse 7. I actually was, we were looking at this verse uh, with uh, Mr. Siegler Sr. Uh, 
uh, the other day, he, he mentioned it. It's a good verse. 6, 7. Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall the Spirit reap life everlasting. This biblical concept that you reap what you sow, right? God forgives, God saves, you're going to heaven, but is your world still trashed by all the sins you committed and all the problems you made? You bet it is, right? God, God's going to save your soul, but he's not going to bibbity bobbity boo all your life. Sometimes churches, I think, preach that, teach that. It's practical, though. Think about... Let's say that, um, I was just reading an article, it's kind of sad. This guy was a, a drunk driver, right? And so a drunk driver uh, killed four people in a wreck. And he got um, 51 years to life in prison, right? Which, I understand that, a lot of people are dead, really sad. It's kind of silly that sometimes they don't give murders the death, or the life sentence or the death penalty. But anyways, this drunk driver is going to be in prison for possibly his whole life for a stupid mistake, right? One mistake. Probably had a history of it, but anyway, one mistake at that moment. One mistake is going to put him in jail forever. So let's say in jail, let's say he gets saved when he's in jail. Does he get out of jail? Doesn't get out of jail. He's still got to live with the consequences of his sins. Live with the consequences of his sins. This actually is what the Bible talks about over in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. You look there at 1 Corinthians 7. I never read down through this passage uh, to this section. I don't do it often. Look at 7 and verse 18. Salvation will get you. You'll escape that fiery place called hell. Praise the Lord. But there's still consequences for sins. Look at um, 1 Corinthians 7, verse 18. It says, Is any man called being circumcised? Let him not become uncircumcised. Is any called an uncircumcision? Let him not be circumcised. Circumcision is nothing, and uncircumcision is nothing, but the keeping of the commandments of God. Let every man abide in the same calling wherein he was called. Art thou called being a servant? Care not for it. If thou mayest be made free, use it rather. It talks about when you're called, when you get saved, right? Abide in your calling, right? It's because Onesimus is a Christian now doesn't mean he's not a slave. It doesn't mean he still doesn't have that debt he's got to pay to that man. It says in verse 22, For he that is called in the Lord, being a servant, is the Lord's free man. Likewise also he that is called, being free, is Christ's servant, you are bought with a price. Be not ye the servants of men. Brethren, let every man wherein he is called there and abide with God. The whole chapter talks about this, this idea that you abide where God calls you when you're saved, right? You're a, if you're a, a slave, a servant, you're still a servant, and you should just embrace that role. And it says there in verse 22, though you're a servant, you're the Lord's free man. We need to think above worldly circumstances, right? Let's say, you are, let's say you are the person who is in prison for life for that drunk driving accident. Let's say that is you. How do you live? I mean, how do you get by? You, you just simply, you read that verse, 22. And say, though I'm a prisoner in this world, I'm the Lord's free man. I'm going to glorify God to the best I can, given the circumstances that have happened because of my one stupid mistake. It's a biblical concept. And maybe some of you who are thinking ahead, you know where I'm going with this. I talked to a man earlier this week about this topic. What if you married? It's a hot topic. I'm not bringing it up. I'm only bringing it up because I think God wants me to, and I think the, the churches are getting way wrong. And this has nothing to do with my previous church or previous arguments with anybody. Simply that I think the world doesn't understand this, so I want to preach it. And one day, whether you agree with me this morning or not, one day I think you'll run into this situation. At least we'll know what verses are practical. A question I ask you, what if... You, in your past, married somebody who was unsaved. Right? One mistake. One mistake. We'll, we'll, actually, let's get to that one in a second. What about this instead? What if you married someone when you were unsaved? That's even better. You were unsaved. One mistake. One mistake, right? 
Well, then later on you get saved and you realize that you really kind of married this, this crazy person. Didn't pray about it. You weren't even saved. Okay? Does getting saved get you out of that marriage? Now, the Bible says marriage is unto death, and at the altar you said until death do us part, right? You did. So does getting saved get you out of that marriage? No. Just like the person in prison for life, you're still in that marriage for life. There's a false notion throughout all of our churches, and why do they do it? To accommodate people. But is it biblical to say that getting saved undoes something that God said is until death? No, it doesn't. It's not biblical. Does, I understand, I've met so many people lately. Every week I meet people who are talking to me about this topic because people are jumping into marriages and they're jumping out of marriages just like this. This morning, I'm sure across America, there's a thousand people deciding that their marriage is done, they're through, they're going to go on to another one. We've got to preach it. I know you folks are tired of me. Logan. I see like a one-topic person. But it's really, I'm not, it's not a pet because of my history with anybody. I believe this is, a, this is a truth that the world and our churches are not preaching anymore. And marriages are falling apart because of it. So can you get out of a marriage because you're unsaved? The answer is no. Look at 1 Corinthians 7 and 39. 7 39. The wife is bound by the law as long as her husband liveth. But if her husband be dead, she is at liberty to be married to whom she will only in the Lord. Just like Romans 7 the rule is death. It's the only thing that ends a marriage. It mentions no other exceptions, and it certainly does not mention any exception about whether the person was a believer, you were a believer, anything like that. It doesn't mention it, okay? So just think about that, 1 Corinthians 7, or 7, 39. Now let's ask that other question, because truly this is what someone asked me recently. What if you married someone who was unsaved? Okay? What if you married someone who's unsaved? Can you get out of that marriage? Now having no, now you know the truth, you know they're not saved. Can you get out of that? I've heard people say, well, we weren't equally yoked. And I say, yeah, that's true. That's true. That was a bad decision, wasn't it? I'm sorry, that's not a proof text. Look at 1 Corinthians um, 7. And let's start here, verse 1. You, you know, I've, there are people who, who have all kinds of different stances on divorce or marriage. And there's different stances. There's different levels of, I think, discernment. But this one is big, this whole idea that, well, it happened in the past and God forgives and it's over and done with and we're now we're okay. It really just opens the door to embrace sin. And why does this matter, congregation? Wherever we as a people, as Christians, as a pulpit, are trying to find excuses for sins, then we are not on God's team. Why do I preach something like this? Why do I want you to study this passage? Because this is a sin that is being shoved down our throats. And Christian, you better know how to answer it for your own life and for your friends and your loved ones. What are you going to tell your, your loved one when they're about to divorce their spouse because, well, you know, we, we weren't equally yoked? Well, if you're worth your salt, you'll shoot back with these passages. And you won't, you won't be mad at a pastor this morning for trying to share them because it's that big of an issue. If I thought our Christian worlds were, were, were really struggling with homosexuality, we'd hit it every Sunday, right? And I hit it. But that's not what the church today is struggling. Decent churches are struggling. Decent churches are struggling with this. Decent Christians are struggling with this. Look at 1 Corinthians 7, verse 1. It says, uh, verse 10, excuse me. Let's go to 10 for the sake of time. 1 Corinthians 7 and verse, yeah, 10 would be fine. And unto the married I command, yet not I, but the Lord. Look at that. I, I know there's a gentleman in our audience who, who likes every word, and I do too. Look at that. It says, And unto the married I command, yet not I, but the Lord. Paul is about to throw down the conclusion of what Jesus Christ taught on this issue. Okay? He said, this is not my commandment. Maybe he's even saying it because he doesn't want to be held accountable. This is what Christ said. So watch me this. Yet not I, but the Lord. Let not the wife depart from her husband. He says, Christ says. And in fact, we know that Christ did say that. Mark 10, Matthew 19, Luke 16. Let not the wife depart from her husband. That means keep the marriage together. Look at verse 11. But if she depart, okay, if she departs, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband and let not the husband put away his wife. We should first note there are no exceptions given of any, any shape or form. Are there here? And look what Christ is teaching in verse 11. He's saying if separation or divorce happens, 
right, the, the departing there, if separation or divorce happens, it says, let her remain what? Unmarried, according to what Christ taught. Or be reconciled. Now, me as a pastor trying to run a young ministry, i got to look at that, and I've got to apply that according to the best way I know how. And to me, that says, if you have a, a union that broke up, that means they should either stay unmarried or they should get reconciled back together. What it does not mean in my mind whatsoever, and I fear God enough to not go to this, it does not mean, Logan, let's, let's remarry this person to somebody else. Because that would be following verse 11. No, that would be destroying verse 11. It says, remain unmarried, or it says, be reconciled. Some Yehu pastor remarrying somebody, they're destroying 11 from ever happening, because then it's a lot harder to reconcile when you get married again, and then you have a couple new kids, right? Then reconciliation becomes really hard. Follow verse 11. Just what Christ I Remember, that's what, those are Christ's words. Christ says it very clearly for us. Now look, oh, 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 by the way, on this topic, hold a bookmark right here, would you? And, and look at um, Romans 7. Romans 7, because I just mentioned something. I just said, what if some pastor, some wishy-washy pastor does marry them again? Well, what happens? Logan, what do you do with that person? So now these people got married again, Logan. What do you do? It's an impossible situation. You just said it. Romans 7, please. Romans 7, I don't, I don't ask you to believe everything I believe on this topic, but I, I hope that you don't begrudge me of preaching it because it, it's lacking in our world today. I hope you don't begrudge me preaching it. Romans 7 and verse 3. What happens if this goofy second marriage has already happened? It says, verse 3, So then if while her husband liveth, she be married to another man, okay, that, that goofy second marriage has happened. Some pastor said, didn't read the other verse we just read. They just, they just let it happen. Married some other man, she should be called an adulteress. That's present tense. That's, that's her title. She's got another spouse, and now she married somebody else. So now she's committing adultery every time she goes to the marriage bed. Adulteress. But if her husband be dead, there's that rule again we see throughout Scripture, dead, she is free from that law so that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. So what's the rule? It's not Logan's rule. Some say, Logan, what, what are you asking? What are you asking? Are you going to break up all these other marriages? Are you going to break up these new marriages? In fact, Logan, don't you know that they, they have a kid too? I know he had a kid with the first wife, but now he's got a kid with the second wife. And isn't it wrong to break something else up as well? Well, emotionally, I'm right there with you. Ah, boy, that sounds hard. Let's just go eat some popcorn and watch some TV. That's what I want to do really bad. Love popcorn, love TV. But what does the Bible say? I got to open my Bible and say, well, you know what it says that while, while that first spouse is living, I'm sorry, while that first spouse is living, it looks like what you're living in is adultery. I don't know any other way to preach. I actually said that about word for word with somebody the week before. I told him, I said, I said, sir, if there, if there was a way that I could preach this a different way, if there's a way I could get around this for you, if there's a way I could make it so that everything's okay, I'd do it, but I can't because I've got to stand on the word of God. Is it my fault? No. Is the Bible's fault? No. Can you put a lot of blame on our ungodly society for teaching these wicked things? Yeah. Yeah. Ultimately, it still comes down to the person. But I know, I know people have been raised with this thing that you can jump in and out of marriage, and we need to preach it today and preach it moving forward that you can't. Let's go back to our text there, please. 1 Corinthians 7. I'm going to have five minutes. I want to read down more of the context because it answers some questions for us. Um, 1 Corinthians 7. You, you know, we can, there's a lot of verses on this topic, and I, I, would, I would rarely study it with anybody. In love and meekness, I'd try to show you what I think the Scriptures teach. Uh, I know every one of our lives are affected by this topic, so I try to have grace. But I also have some contempt for wicked churches. 1 Corinthians 7, verse, look down here at verse 12. Now Paul gives his opinion, right? He said, that's what the Lord commanded, verse 10 and 11, very clear. That's his summary of what Christ taught in the Gospels. Okay, you get that? Christ's summary, or Paul's summary of Christ's teaching is what I do when I summarize Christ's teaching. Boom, done, until death. Two become one, never again twain. 
Let that not man put asunder. I'm just like Paul. I got the same conclusion, and I am appalled or I'm amazed that other people get different conclusions from Christ's clear teaching. Look at verse 12. Paul gives his revelation on this important topic. 12. But to the rest speak I, not the Lord. If any brother have a wife that believeth not, and she be pleased to dwell with him, let him not put her away. He gives us some practical advice, and I love that God used Paul for this because a lot of people are in this situation. They married somebody who's bad. And so he's going to walk through. Can you keep it together or not? Can you keep the house together or not? And so far he's saying, look, if they're, if they're pleased to dwell with him, it's going okay. Yeah, dwell together. Keep it together. Look at 13. And the woman which hath an husband that believeth not, and if he be pleased to dwell with her, let her not leave him. Saying, keep it together, keep it together. Why? For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Else, else were your children unclean, but now are they holy? Yes, absolutely. We should be praying, praying and preaching that marriages stay together. Even if you're on equal yoke, stay together because it's best for the kids. It's best for the unbelieving spouse. I love testimonies of, uh, well, it's hard, but women give me testimonies of, my husband wasn't saved for 50 years, and we prayed for him for 50 years, and then he got saved. Well, praise the Lord. You know what destroys that? Well, you're on an equal yoke, so go find another one somewhere. And leave the kids and him, and yeah, go. Wrong. This is how it's the best practice. He's saying, keep it together. Now watch, the context here is what? Stay together, keep it together, keep, stay in the same house. Verse 15. But if the unbelieving depart, let him depart. A brother or sister is not under bondage in such cases, but God hath called us unto peace. Verse 15 is a big verse that we want to look at here a little bit. The context, as we said, is all about what if you get people who are saved and unsaved? Well, you try to keep it together. You try to live with them. You dwell with them, right? They want to dwell with you. You want to dwell for the kids. You dwell together. But what if they just walk out the house? What if they issue divorce papers, Right? Now, pastors today, in my shoes, they'll say, oh, okay, look, this means that there is an exception. If the unbelieving person walks away from a relationship, ah, 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 marriage off. Marriage is off. But what is the context? Not that at all. In fact, at verse 11, it says, but if she depart, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband. And let the husband put away his wife. So if this happens, you don't remarry. The, under, the phrase, not under bondage, is, is not talking about your sealed, your oneness, as it says in Genesis chapter 2 and Christ says in the Gospels, your oneness. It's talking about it's not your fault if your unbelieving spouse gets so bad that they just go off into the bars and you can't keep them at home and you can't keep a nice house. God's not going to hold you responsible. And I know some women in that situation right now. they got a husband not pleased to dwell. They've run off. Well, it's not her fault. His fault. But is the marriage still intact? Yeah, it is. Because look at, well, look at the very end of the chapter. 39, the wife, 39, the wife is bound by the law as long as her husband liveth. If you're looking for exceptions, we have to be honest and read the whole context. Bound by as long as her husband liveth, let her husband be dead. She's at liberty to be married to whom she will, only in the Lord. As we study scripture, we should absolutely let the clear passages lead the argument. Lead our doctrine. If you are fishing for reasons to help somebody commit adultery, we're in the wrong business. Looking for some reasons to appease somebody because they're in sin, you are, the, not, you are a false prophet. You're, you're in the wrong business. The whole context here is about sticking together. Look at what it says later on. What I mean the whole context? Well, continue with me. Look at 16. For, that, for what thou knowest, O wife, whether thou shalt save thy husband, or how knowest thou, O man, whether thou shalt save thy wife? Again, hearkening, stay together. 17, but as God hath distributed to every man, as the Lord hath called every one, so let him walk, and so ordain I in all churches. We know what we've already read. Down in verse 20, let everyone abide in the same calling. Abide in the same calling. It hearkens to that, you reap what you sow principle. You married this person. No one put a gun to your head and said, you've got to marry this unsaved person who's got problems and we know it. You chose to. And God honors marriage. We know that. How about this? This is, to me, is an argument that I think blows all the exceptions out the window because what if both people are unsaved, which is most marriages today? Okay, most marriages today, what if both people are unsaved and one of them leaves, one of them departs, one of them divorces? Does that mean that the next marriage is okay? No, absolutely does not. Hey, good morning. Nice to see you. 
Absolutely does not. Because the Bible says in Hebrews 13, 4, marriage, good to see you. Come on in, folks. Anywhere you'd like. Sit. Marriage is honorable and all, and the bed undefiled, but whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. Remember that verse in Hebrews um, 13, 4. If you ever wonder why churches still need to keep this on their radar, right? Because if you haven't seen it, you look there, Hebrews 13, 4. Marriage is honorable and all. That means God honors even unsaved unions. Marriage is honorable and all. That means God honors even unions between people who are unequally yoked. Right? Saved and unsaved. Marriage is honorable and all. And the bed undefiled. But whoremongers and adulterers, God will judge. It's an important topic because judgment falls for sin. And so we as... Um, practitioners, we as gospel preachers, we as Christians have got to still discern what sin is and isn't. So don't tell me it's not a topic worth you knowing an answer on to give to the world. It says in verse, we are, we are out of time, I'm sorry. Look at Psalm and chapter, actually let's just, let's go to Malachi chapter 2 to close. Malachi 2. Malachi chapter 2 to close. Important issue, and I think it does hearken directly to what we learn in Philemon. Well, not directly, but I think the, the lesson is there, I should say. If you're in Malachi chapter 2, I would, I would want to read this verse to you one second. It's in Psalm 50 and verse 18. It says, When thou sawest a thief, then consentest with him. Right? Paul didn't consent with Philemon. He says, Philemon, we need to make this right. Okay? And then it goes on to say in Psalm 50, verse 18, and hast been partakers with adulterers. Well, you Christian today, our job today is not to consent with or to put a stamp of approval on or to okay adultery. It's not. Our job is to preach, thus saith the Lord, even when it gets hard. Even when it's hard. To close, look at Malachi chapter 2 and verse 14. Someone said this to me the other day. They said this passage is, is good for, to show exceptions. And I'm sorry. This passage to me is really clear that there, that there aren't exceptions. Malachi 2.14 says, Yet ye say, Wherefore, because the Lord hath been witness between thee and the wife of thy youth, against whom thou hast de dealt, hast dealt treacherously, yet is she thy companion and the wife of thy covenant. See those words? A marriage comes together in the youth. Probably people didn't made mistakes. Probably someone was saved. Probably someone wasn't saved. Maybe both of them weren't saved. But it's the wife of your youth. And it says here, even if something treacherous happens, even if there's infidelity, even if there's unfaithfulness, even if there's a divorce, as it talks about in Jeremiah, it says, yet is she thy companion and the wife of thy covenant. Marriage is still intact, even in hard times. Because, verse 15 talks about the oneness principle, which I, I pray you'd look into. It's, it's throughout Scripture, starting in Genesis 2. 15, and did, he not, and did not he make one? Yet had he the residue of the Spirit. And wherefore one, that he might seek a godly seed. Therefore take heed to your spirit, and let none deal treacherously against the wife of his youth. Wife of his youth is just another way of saying the first one you married. The one you said until death do us part. And then some other preacher came along and said, I can find an exception for you. 16, for the Lord, the God of Israel, saith that he hateth putting away. For one covereth violence with his garment, saith the Lord of hosts. Therefore take heed to your spirit that ye deal not treacherously. We just saw it in 1 Corinthians 7. When he quotes the Lord, it says, don't put away. Right? God says, let not man put asunder. Here it says that God hates the practice of putting away divorce. And yet there are preachers today who will say, actually, you know what? Yours is an okay deal. It's wrong. And marriages and homes are wrecked because of it. 17, let's just read this to close. You have wearied the Lord with your words. Yet ye say, wherein have ye, we wearied him? When ye say, everyone that doeth evil is good in the sight of the Lord. Though that's our churches today. That's our world. Weary in the Lord. And he delighteth in them, or where is the God of judgment? So you, my Christian friend, I know we've gone five minutes over, but my Christian friend, you and I both need to avoid this. I don't want to be this person that says that evil is good, and neither do you. So it behooves all of us to have a stance on this. And you might not agree with mine perfectly, but you should have a stance that says this is plain evil, and this is okay.
Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, thank you for the Bible, Lord. Thank you for the lesson of Philemon. It blessed my heart, Lord, as I saw truths about we do reap what we sow. You save us from an eternal hell, Lord, but we still reap the consequences of bad decisions, and we should abide in our calling and seek to glorify God wherever we are called. I pray now, Lord, you give us a special blessing on the next service. If the Spirit would work, Lord, and you keep my flesh out of the way, my wicked flesh. I thank you for the visitors we have, or Lord, who are Lord willing coming. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.